So I'm going to talk today about architecting quickly with Swift, um, from zero to almost hero. Um, so the background for this talk is actually, I got the WWDC scholarship this year, and one of the requirements of it was to develop a app in Swift. And I'd read a bit of documentation, but I pretty much hadn't bothered to ever use it. And at the point that I had to build the app, I think I had about three days to build it. So it's just a reflection on my experiences using Swift. So a little about me, I'm a PhD student at UQ, uh, interaction designer, I do a lot of design stuff but also code. Uh, I was at UQX, which is UQ's edX branch, um, and now I'm working at Shorthand, which is a news media startup. So. The presentation is not about creating great apps, just be clear. It's about getting great ideas on device fast and Anvil. Thank you. Um, dev, dev world. Um, anyway, so what do we want to achieve? So this is my experiences dealing with clients where they come with you, they have an idea, and what you really want to do is you want to get an app in their hands that they can play with. Um, often they will have some kind of idea, but they really they can't conceptualize it in their head. And you can go away and architect this beautiful, beautifully structured application that you give back to them. And then they realize they want something completely different. So Apple talks about this quite a bit. Um, so this year they did the Designing for Future Hardware video. If you haven't watched it, I highly recommend it. So they actually use Keynote to build lightweight prototype apps that they can test. Um, so that has a lot of benefits. Um, so obviously the first starting point is to develop your concept. So obviously. Uh, design your app before you build it. Um, if possible, separate the design out. Um, so on the right here, we have, this is a, some client work that I've recently been doing. Um, and this kind of shows the variety of work. So this is a Russian, a Russian version of Uber. Um, so um, we use, for this app, we use Envision. So what this means is that the designers can get us... Um, assets and show the basic interaction really quickly but at the same time what we want to do is we want to actually get it on device um, but the more you can get done before you actually start coding the quicker the apps actually going to get finished um, and if nothing else at least have a sketch okay so I'm just going to talk briefly about my kind of setup um, everyone's got their own way of doing things it's all fairly standard but just in case so, creating a new Git uh, Xcode project, set it up in GitHub firstly. I cannot see you guys, but I'm hoping that everyone's using GitHub or Bitbucket. Um, getting provisioning profiles set up, get that set up early. Um, it's a lot easier to get your infrastructure set up early, especially with clients, rather than trying to do it the last minute of a deadline. Um, Grab your relevant libraries and get your assets organized. So, just quickly, I'm just going to flip over. I should mention here that um, on top of all the technical dramas that we've been having here, getting the video conferencing set up, my actual app that I was going to present has also died. So, it's a disaster so far. Anyway, these are the assets. So, we have these assets set up. They don't really do much. Um, and they don't have anything except filler data, but at least gives us something to work with. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to go over, and I have a really simple Xcode project set up. Um, I've got three pods in there. Where are we? There we are. So I'll go through these, but essentially three pods, and it's a sample setup project. And of course, it's on Git. Okay, um, really side note, just because in case people don't know about them, um, two applications that I really recommend that are awesome. One is Color Snapper. 
Um, it saves me hours of kind of just mindless finding colors, etc. And also Dash. Dash is fantastic. Um, it does an average job of getting the iOS documentation in place, but it also has a lot of third-party documentations. So there's like PDFs of what are all the different phone sizes and iPad sizes and stuff like that. So you can collect all those assets together and have one place for them. So it's actually really useful. Um, Color Snapper, for people that haven't seen it before, um, if I pull it up, all I can do is I can just go a shortcut key, go over anything like that, whatever, but instead of just copying me the hex, it'll actually color, copy me the UI color, and you can set it up for Swift as well. So. Okay, quick side note, uh, CocoaPods versus Carthage versus Manual, um, and this is in the context of how do you get stuff done fast. Um, the choice is really up to you. Honestly, package management is a bit of a double-edged sword. Um, a lot of people will swear by using pods, but at the same time, I've seen many projects where you spend hours trying to get the dependencies installed and working properly. So don't kind of don't go for it just because everyone else is going for it. Um, figure out what works best for you in the context. Um, Especially if you're moving applications between multiple developers a lot, um, you can run into some issues there. Cool. Uh, so, talking about Swift. Uh, so, this is my experience with Swift so far. Um, I've only built a few apps so far, but both are fantastic. Um, Swift is officially faster. I haven't really tested it, but that's what everyone says. Um, and it has a bit more, a few more language features like closures and a bit functional programming stuff, which is useful, especially if you jump between multiple programming languages. Um, it works a bit better with your style. But that being said, Objective-C is more mature and has a lot better documentation. Um, it is getting a little bit better, but for the most part, what I tend to recommend, because I also do some teaching as well at UQ, is for new students, I find them they're better learning Objective-C first, because that's where all the documentation is. And then once they're used to it and understand all the iOS frameworks, then move to Swift. Cool. So, how to learn Swift for Objective-C people. And this was purely based on my experience. Um, forget reading any documentation. Um, just build an app um, and use Xcode to translate your code. So, randomly write, um, kind of guess what the function name would be and then like Xcode figure it out for you. So it's kind of like writing with Google Translate. Um, Swift also has a, a few strange things in terms of question marks like optionals or typecasting. Um, these are random punctuation. You can pretty much ignore it for the most part and just let Xcode deal with it. Okay, so Swift Reflections so far. It's a lot less code, so in terms of getting things done fast, it's actually really good compared to Objective-C. Um, the fact that you can say, I'll just bring this up, let's just run this, so if I'm going to so again this is all fairly standard Objective-C, but I'm just letting Xcode fix it up. Background color. Sad. Uh, whoops, my bad. I'm just going to run this quickly. So for people who haven't played with Swift much, again, this is how I learned Swift is just guessing, purely guessing. Anyway, so here's a red box. But the beautiful thing, the absolute beautiful thing in Swift is I can then say my view dot frame dot origin dot y equals 200. And that's worth switching from Objective-C to Swift. 
There's nothing else you need to do. Oh, uh, there is one other thing is um, being able to do string concatenation again instead of ns string string by appending string again makes life a hundred times easier uh, so a few things um, string versus ns string array versus ns array um, sometimes when you're using different um, apple apis you'll start getting random different types of objects back which can be quite confusing and frustrating um, but for the most part you can typecast around it um, the only issue is number conversion um, Swift to be honest isn't very good at that there are actually a few frameworks out there now that you can install via pods which overwrite that but essentially it's converting CG floats to doubles and back and forth that is quite frustrating um, cool uh, Swift to Objective-C integration, uh, so you can do it. Um, I did it a few times, but what I found was it's actually better just to move entirely to Swift where you can. There's a few times that you need to do it, especially with old um, iOS libraries that you need to use because the client wants you to use it. Um, but apart from that, try and go completely with Swift. Okay, so what I highly recommend, and a lot of people will say don't bother, just do it in, all in code, is actually storyboard out your pages. When you're trying to get stuff done fast, um, storyboards are fantastic. They're quick, um, they're not Git friendly. Um, a lot of the times you can run into weird issues where you get conflicts, but as long as you're being careful about when you're messing with storyboards and making sure no one else is, you're fine. Um, iOS 9, there's storyboard references where you can actually decouple your storyboards and self-contain them, um, which looks to be really good for Git friendliness. Okay, so a few things that I've learned. So firstly, ditch auto layout from the start. Um, you can always bring it back later. It's just, it's something that is frustrating and I know pretty much in most apps that I've done, I get about halfway through the app using auto layout and everything's broken and frustrating and takes hours and then I turn off auto layout and everything suddenly works. So you can always bring it back. Um, generally with apps, I do bring it back um, just so it's more responsive across the devices and especially with multilingual, so I'd usually do it at the same time as localization. Uh, standard view controllers. Uh, use the functionality that Interface Builder gives you where you can switch stuff in quite easily. So, just an example here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to mess around quickly I'm just going to throw a few view controllers up and I'm going to put a button here and just drag that over, push to a push segue, however if I do this it will crash. Crash. Um, and a lot of the time this is quite frustrating when you forget to do the do the UI navigation or UI tab bar, um, stuff like that. But for those people that don't know, you can actually go editor, embed in, and then navigation controller, and then everything works. So a little hint, most people probably know it, but for those that don't, it's a lifesaver. And... My computer just froze. Okay, I'm gonna stop that for the moment. Okay, let's just pull this in quickly. So the other thing that I highly recommend is when you're doing this quickly, especially if you're working with a designer, um, that you just pull the assets in straight away into the asset manager, which is really easy. Um, I should have done these as 2x, but whatever. Um, 
and then pulling them straight into the storyboard. I'm just going to pull this into an image view. I'm going to set it up so it does proper. So what I'll do is I'll often, I'll tidy these up a bit, but I'll try and get my entire storyboard done and I'll put in all the assets straight out of the Photoshop doc and then I'll link it through with storyboards. So I'll just put a fake button over the button and I'll link it through. So at that point I can give it back to the client and get them to click through and basically feel how the app is feeling. Um, what it means is, is if the client has a change of mind, they have a change of mind before I've started implementing the UI. It means I can go back to the designer, work with the designer to refine, and we can just iterate through that without me actually having to get directly into the code or dealing with something like Envision, which is pretty good. But if you're doing complex interactions, um, you have to start faking stuff. So. Go back to Keynote. Okay, so usually I do that and then pull in the navigation. So for everything that I can do, I just create segues between view controllers directly. Um, sometimes that's not good enough. So especially if you want buttons that are changing between two different tabs or something. At that point, I start doing the very simple IB actions, the call segues again, and then create skeleton methods for prepare for segue that I can start to push through. And then we can optimize later. So after the designers have refined the UI, after the client has approved everything, as much as the clients kind of try to approve everything from the start, there's a whole heap of stuff that comes out throughout the process. And it's better if you're getting that fixed at the design time rather than a build time. Uh, in terms of pulling data in, um, the best way that I've found is just having an API manager um, or a model manager. It's just a single file that extends an NS object. It's a singleton, so you can get API manager, shared manager, and then have abstract get and post methods or and put and delete if you need them um, that do the calls for you and then have blocks that call back into the view controllers. This is the code that was working for me this morning but then my server died where I was hosting the API. So anyway, um, basically what this means is if you have this single file where all your APIs are going you can get stuff up really fast and then later on, when you want to pull in uh, magical record, core data, caching layers, anything like that, you can stick it in the API manager as kind of an interface between your backend persistent storage and your view controllers. Um, one thing I did find is as much as Swift is a modern language, uh, JSON in Swift is actually quite painful. Swifty JSON makes life incredibly easy and makes it feel like a modern language with dealing with JSON. Cool. Hook up your data. So, hooking up any delegates to the view controllers, so fairly simple, exactly the same as you would do it in Objective-C. Uh, pushing data through the prepare for segue method. Um, linking up images. So, one thing I should mention is a few of the... A few of the pods that I have here, you may not have heard of if you're coming from an Objective-C perspective. So Alamo Fire in particular, I'll just bring it up. Fantastic. Uh, is Elegant Networking in Swift. So it's actually built by, and don't quote me on this, but I'm 90% sure, the same guys that built AF Networking, but it's the Swift version. Um, and it's actually, I hate to say it, it's actually nicer than AF networking. So if I pull it up here, I'm just going to run this code. I'm 
I'm just going to paste that in, run it. And basically, that's all you need to do HTTP requests, either get or post. Um, so it's actually fairly beautiful in its simplicity um, compared to NSURL request or even AF networking. Um, now, one thing that Alamo Fire doesn't have is support for um, AF networking's UI image. Um, for that, going back to my point, uh, the HANA key method is actually really nice for doing UI image and it actually supports a lot of extra features. So it supports caching for different sizes of image um, and a few other things. So it's kind of a beaut beautiful framework for doing uh, URL based image calls. Um, so my process is, as I said, going through the storyboards, just shoving in whatever the designer came up with. And then as I go through this, and I do apologize, this was working. So on here, I could just leave this background screenshot here and then start to go through and add UI view. I can just throw a view up here, shove it down, shove it around, stick it here. Again, pull this in. Very, very quick. And I just do this very, very quickly. So this isn't about creating an architecture that will work for the finished application, but it's something that you can quickly iterate on without getting bogged down into, oh no, I've created the wrong models, all that kind of stuff. So at this point, I could quickly hook this up back to my view controller. Um, if that was doing it right. And then I could quickly send this back to a very, very simple post method that sent the data and registered. So I could actually start to build functionality into the app with almost no code. Um, so this is where I prefer this over doing something like Keynote, because this actually gives you functionality um, without too much more effort, especially if you're used to Interface Builder and so forth. Cool. Um, so. What this really means is that you end up doing about 10% of the effort and you have something you can get real feedback from. So rather than spending four weeks to develop an initial version that then you take back to the client and they give you 10 pages of feedback, you can spend a day and get pretty much 90% of the app working on device. Um, and then you can get a heap of feedback from the client and you can spend the rest of the week working on that feedback. Um, most importantly, you know whether the idea is terrible within a day rather than within four weeks. Um, and you may have to re-architect it, but you'll now know what you have to re-architect it to. Um, and worst case scenario, if your architecture actually ends up becoming company legacy code, um, then that's someone else's problem. Um, because at the end of the day, um, you can always re-architect it later. Generally, version 1 is pretty poor, version 2 is over-architected and never releases, and version 3 is the decent version. Cool. So, just quickly, getting on device. Um, I used to use Test Flight quite a lot, but then recently Twitter Fabric has come out, um, and it's absolutely fantastic, uh, especially since Test Flight has moved into the Apple ecosystem. Uh, it's a bit of a pain because you have to get the beta applications semi-approved by Apple, um, especially if you're pushing out beyond your developer circle. Um, and that can be quite painful. Twitter Fabric, even though it still uses the old UDID provisioning profile pane, 
uh, is actually a really nice interface and we've found that clients are pretty good with it, um, a lot better than they used to be with test flight. Um, and yeah, otherwise just USB plug and play. Um, get your clients into the office, plug them in, get it on device as quickly as possible. And it just means that the other thing is you can really test with different device sizes um, so you can figure out if an iPhone 4S is going to be a pain and most importantly, and <laughs> this is the best thing about following this process is you can find out what devices your clients are using really early on. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the projects that I've worked on we've built for or we've designed for iPhone 6 and then the clients come in at the end and they've only got an iPhone 4S and then suddenly everything's a mess. Um, so it's just another way of getting a whole much better idea of the entire context very quickly. So yeah, um, so just quickly, really quickly, um, I'm going to pull this up. So again, this was following the same process. Um, so this was the app I built for WWDC this year. I did have another app prepared, but it broke on me. But again, very simple using Interface Builder to do up all the screens, just throwing stuff in there. Um, again, I do have my app model this one is playing with a bit of a different architecture, which I iterated on over time, uh, where basically I have models sitting on top. Um, and the main reason for this was just so I could do caching because I wasn't sure if the API would hold up with Apple testing stuff. But again, very simple app. Come on. Um, but the one thing I wanted to show here, um, was just the, wherever it is, the transition manager stuff, especially using it in Swift is incredibly beautiful. Um, it looks like a bit of code, but it's really only kind of 20 minutes, half an hour. Um, and you can do some really nice transitions between screens, um, and get stuff a lot more dynamic and fluid. Yeah, so I'll probably leave it at that and then see if anyone has any questions.